Good morning, Pastor Connor here. It is 7.30 on January 12th. Thanks so much for joining me this morning and um, spending some time reflecting with me and then praying with me. Love seeing your names pop up. Uh, so welcome everyone who is joining me this morning. Glad to welcome you. Okay, so um, like you, over the last, well, several weeks really, but um, I have been carefully and thoughtfully watching the events in our country uh, as they've kind of been unfolding over the last several weeks. And processing all of this takes time. And given the speed at which everything is unfolding, reflective thought isn't always easy. And you know that. If you've ever tried to think about something for any length of time, when it keeps moving and changing so rapidly, it's, it's hard to do that. And further, we need to understand that, and this is important, we can't forget this, that we are constantly being fed images by those who control them, by those in power, the images that they want us to see. And make no mistake, those images are carefully cropped and they're shaped a certain way to communicate a certain message. And they're designed to produce emotional responses. And look, emotions have their place, right? I mean, emotions can alert us to something's not rightness, that something is not right. So emotions, they have their place, but they can also be the enemy of careful, considered thought. So today I want to invite you to think with me. So, you know, if you're looking for emoting, I mean, you can turn into just about any, tune in just about any major news outlet or just scroll through any social media feed and look, you'll find more than enough emoting out there to, to take care of that desire if that's what you want. I mean, you can get your emotions wound up in just a couple seconds, right? All, right, all it takes is one little internet meme and you can have your emotions through, through the roof, right? But I want to invite you to think with me for a few moments, to bring our Christian worldview to bear on our present situation. What do we know to be true and how can we bring that to bear on what we are seeing? And this is an important thing for us to do all the time. What do we know to be true? How do we bring it to bear on what we're seeing? So let's not let the emotions sit in the driver's seat, okay? Let's let careful thought sit there. That'd be a much more uh, um, reasonable and controlled trip than if the emotions are driving. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Today we're gonna do some foundational work, work on the foundation a little bit. And for some of us, this is gonna seem tedious and basic because we really want to get to the, you know, the upsetting stuff, the stuff we're seeing on the news. But the foundation is where the battle is won or lost. I actually remember something that Coach Foreman said. Coach Foreman, uh, former uh, football coach here in Manning for many, many years, well-loved, a respected member of Zion. Uh, they moved to Indiana to be closer to family. So uh, uh, Foreman's, we wish you well in Indiana. But I remember something Coach Foreman said he said that some of his football players just wanted to show up and play the game. They didn't want to master the fundamentals. But he said, you can't play the game well until you've mastered those fundamentals. And what he said holds true across the board. We need to drill down on the first things, the foundational things, before we move on to the other things. So we have to get the foundation right before we can build the house. And sometimes I think we get a little too eager to get to all the interior decorating and we neglect the foundation. And that's, it's just not going to end well if you do that. So we end up being Christians driven by emotions and not careful, reasoned, scripturally informed thought. I, I don't think that's helpful for Christianity. It's certainly not helpful for our own, our own mental health, but it's certainly also not helpful for confessing Christ in this world. 
So we end up with all kinds of shallow, inappropriate, accusatory internet memes, like I mentioned, that do nothing to promote meaningful conversation and everything to inflame emotions. It's not helpful. I can't think of anything good that comes from it. Now, tomorrow, I want to visit with you about what I'm going to call personalities and policies. About some of the stuff we're seeing in the news and about how both matter, personalities and policies. And about how both can bring get great good and both have the potential to do great harm. And I want to, I want to try to help us see how it's far too easy to be duped by a, a media hyperventilating over one of these. For example, one brazen and inflammatory personality to keep us distracted from impending and damaging policies. But that will have to wait till tomorrow. We have to do foundation work today. So what do we know to be true? First, God is creator. God is creator. He is Lord. He establishes and defines reality. He defines what is good, and he is sovereign over the nations. And scripture lays this out in the first two chapters of Genesis. This is really important. If you reject this, you reject reality. If you war against this, you war against God and against his creation. And there's a lot of that going on today. In fact, this gets to the heart of just about everything we're seeing today. Man is at war with God, with what God has called good. Second, we are creatures. We do not define reality. We do not define what is good. We describe reality and we defend what is good. And we are not sovereign. We are not the Lord. We're not. Any authority that we have or that our representatives have, this authority is a derived authority. And we've talked about that before when we preached on Romans chapter 13. It does not belong to us. It is entrusted to us for a time and for a purpose. So we live and move and breathe in God's world. It's his. Always has been, always will be. And we are accountable to him. We will give an account to him as to how we have stewarded his creation and how we have exercised any authority he has temporarily entrusted to us. Third, we are fallen creatures. That means we are warped. We are bent by sin. Scripture describes this in a variety of ways. Jesus says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Paul, in Romans, quoting the book of Psalms, says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. No loopholes there, right? And then Solomon, in the book of, um, of uh, Ecclesia, no, Proverbs, I take that back, the book of Proverbs, he's personifying wisdom, and he describes fallen man as rejecting wisdom and reaping the consequences. And this is a fascinating section of text, okay? So listen to his words from Proverbs chapter 1, and then see if they hit home. Okay, again, so this is wisdom being personified, wisdom speaking, this attribute of God, this, this thing that, that God has woven into his creation. Okay, wisdom speaks here. Because I, wisdom, have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded, because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, 
when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have the fill of their own devices. That's wisdom speaking. All right, so God is creator and Lord. We are not. We are contingent creatures, and we are fallen, rebellious creatures. What we're seeing in our culture is just the latest live demonstration of this reality. Man is at war with God, with his creator, with what his creator has called good. And we'll have more to say about this tomorrow, but I want to highlight something I just said, and this is important. We made reference to this not too long ago in one of our morning teachings. So while what we're seeing today in the news, thrown in our face day after day after day, it is upsetting for many reasons. But it is not new. It is not unprecedented. Remember what we said, it was a week or so ago, that there's nothing new under the sun. Book of Ecclesiastes teaches this. C.S. Lewis helped us appreciate this when he wrote, let us not begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. So if you were to read history, and you should read history, you'd see this, right? You'd see guillotines in France during their revolution severing the heads of thousands of people who disagreed. You'd see uh, Muslims, in, Muslim invaders during the times of the Crusades catapulting heads over walls to terrify their enemies. Yeah. You'd see Romans lining their streets with people crucified on crosses to die these excruciating deaths. Or you'd smell burning flesh as they attached them to poles, lit them on fire, and used them as candles to suppress and terrify people into submission. You'd see Assyrians impaling people on poles, planting the poles in the ground, and then letting them die an agonizing death as gravity pulled them earthward. Or you'd see them putting hooks through their cheeks and dragging them off into exile. That's what you'd see in history. Nothing new under the sun. Man is at war with God. So let us not be driven by emotions. What we are witnessing is not new. It's upsetting. It's disturbing, even alarming. But it's not new. Also, it's not eternal. Now, time will prevent me from really getting into this right now, but we worship the God who's going to make all things new. All things. And how do we know this? Because he's risen Jesus from the dead. He's raised Jesus from the dead. Look, America may not exist forever. The kingdom of God will. Our liberties may not be ours forever, but the kingdom of God will. The American experiment may yet fail, but the kingdom of God never will. So again, we turn to scripture. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. This is what we know. This is how we think. This is our foundation. And once we get this, once we get it right, then we're ready to engage our situation thoughtfully, meaningfully, and helpfully. All right, let's take a moment to pray. Lord of history, you reign over the nations. All good that we have is a gift, a temporary trust from you. Forgive us for the way we have stewarded your creation, the way we have used the authority you have entrusted to us. And Father, our nation is experiencing a time of great unrest and uncertainty. Riots, accusations, finger pointing, lies, hypocrisy, performative outrage, and more. But we know from scripture that this is not new. It has been before and it will be again. So by the working of your spirit through your word, teach us wisdom, teach us discernment, teach us to think, to, to think in line with truth, to build our lives on the unmoving foundation of your revelation in scripture and in Christ so that we will be unmoved by fear, but firmly fixed on you, our refuge and strength. For you live and reign with Jesus in the spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. Thank you so much for taking time to be with me today and uh, to reflect with me. Always welcome your comments and questions and insights. Love seeing your names pop up there every morning. Um, thank you for sharing this, whatever capacity you do that. I look forward to being back with you tomorrow morning at 7.30. And just one quick announcement for those of you who are Zion members or those maybe who know. Um, Carol Call, longtime member of Zion, she's been living up at the care facility in Whiting now for over a year. Uh, she passed away on uh, Sunday afternoon, and her funeral is set for Wednesday, that'd be tomorrow, at 10.30 a.m. here at Zion with burial to follow, and then there is no lunch afterwards. But anyway, Carol Call's funeral tomorrow morning, 10.30 at, no, I take that back. Ah, Thursday at 10.30, I almost said it wrong. Scratch that. It's Thursday. I had both dates in my head. Thursday at 10.30, and we'll gather uh, Thursday at 10.30 for Carol's funeral. Sorry about that. I spoke wrong. All right. We'll plan to see you back tomorrow morning at 7.30, and wish you God's blessings on your day.